Can everybody hear me okay? Wow, that's loud. <laughs> Normally I don't need to, uh, I'll, I'll keep this on because it'll allow me to project, but uh, thank you for, uh, for coming today. Um, I say that any time I get to talk about China and the Navy, it's a good day. I mean, my, if you look at my career, half of it has been on the Far East, national security issues related to China, Japan, Northeast Asia, and then half of my career has been with the operating forces as a civilian analyst with the Center for Naval Analysis. So anytime I get to merge those two subjects, it's a good day. And so as I was working with, with both Frank and Preston, who thank you very much, by the way, for the invite, on what I should talk about, I thought, hey, this is a perfect opportunity to review China's naval force structure, where the Chinese Navy is going, and Chinese strategy. And these are two things that often are not combined. That is, in this town, you normally have people who are very good at looking at orders of battle, surface combatants, naval capabilities. The best analysts in the world, I have to say. And then you have people who, who spend their time looking at Chinese written documents. They can, they can translate a Chinese document in two hours, and they'll say, look, I've got it. And then you say, yeah, but what does that mean in terms of Chinese military doctrine? There, there are definitely organizations in this town who merge the two. My former organization, CNA, has a, probably the largest group that does that. Brand also is another group. But it's, it's rare that you have an opportunity to take those two different subjects. And so I thought I would take the opportunity to look at China's naval force structure, where it's going, where it has been, and then to try and marry strategy to it. Where is it that we think China is going uh, with its navy, with its military capabilities? That, to me, besides all of the other problems this country has with wars in the Middle East and other problems, to me, the biggest challenge, whether you think China and the United States are going to be at war and conflict in 20 years or not, this is, to me, the biggest strategic challenge. If we properly manage our relationship with China, we probably avoid a major systemic conflict. If we don't properly manage our relations with China, we're involved in a major systemic war, which is going to affect global security, Asian security. So either way you, you cut it, this is to me is the major challenge of our day. We have other challenges, certainly. But to me, to, to me it's, and this is not only just from my own personal experience, I, I honestly think this is, the, this is the challenge we need to worry about. So today, the top of my talk, China is developing naval force structure and an emerging pattern in China's maritime strategy. So here's, what we're gonna th here's how I've structured the talk today. So what's the debate? What are the experts talking about? Where are we in terms of uh, the, the, the folks who look at the Chinese Navy? What are they saying? We're going to look in time, snapshots in time. What does the Chinese Navy look like from the mid-1990s all the way to the present? Now, I, per, I specifically selected that time frame for a number of reasons. First, it's, it, there's consensus amongst uh, China watchers and defense analysts that that's about the early to mid-90s was when you started seeing evidence of uh, modernization in the Chinese Navy. So that's one reason. So there's a logical reason. The second re reason is my career started around that time frame, mid early 90s, 96, and the first uh, research study I did as a young pup analyst at the Center for Naval Analysis was to look at the Chinese Navy going out 20 years. So in 95, 96, the commander of 7th Fleet asked CNA, what does the Chinese Navy look like in 2000, 2010? So I, I have something personally invested in this question that as a, 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 a 25, 26 year old, I was asked to look at this question and I made predictions about what the Navy would look like 2000, 2010. And then you guys can ask me the question, did, you, did I get it right or not? We, we can talk about that. So, so force structure. Then I ask the question, when you look at Chinese naval force structure over time, what's going on here? Does, does it fit any pattern that we can make sense of, or do we need to interpret this? Um, that, to me, then leads to a question of Chinese grand strategy and strategic objectives. That is, as you look and try and figure out the patterns of, China, the, of the force structure and the military capabilities, is it conforming to some sort of grand strategy or strategic objective that the Chinese have either stated, hinted at, or through their actions you can discern? Then what I'm going to do, I will say, once we've done that, how does that show itself in the maritime strategy? What activities do we see China's actions in the maritime domain conform with, with my stated argument about what their strategy is? And then finally, conclusions and final thoughts. And then somewhere in between, you guys will either say, 
I see it, hallelujah, I agree with you, or you'll completely disagree and we'll have a nice argument discussion, you name it. All right, I'm going to give you a few moments to read this because this is what some of the, some of the best analysts on China's maritime capabilities have to say about this. Uh, I want to point out these gentlemen are former bosses, former professors of mine, former colleagues. And they're widely seen as some of the best analysts on the Chinese Navy. Bud Cole, uh, professor at National War College, widely seen as one of the best experts on the Chinese Navy. Admiral Mike McDevitt, former SYNCPAC J-5 and the Commandant of the National War College, definitely seen as an expert on, on the Chinese military. Patrick Cronin gave me my start. He gave me the job at CNA and was my fo a former professor and ha certainly has something to say on where the Chinese military is going, James Holmes at the War College. So if you read all of these, the impression you get is, is over time, the, chi the China's Navy looks like it's becoming a sea control Navy. That is, either whether you agree that it's, they're controlling the territory within the first island chain within the Asia Pacific, or they're going for something much grander, global capabilities out beyond the first island chain and into the Indian Ocean and possibly the globe. So we're talking right now, many individuals, analysts who I deeply respect make the argument that looks like we're talking about a sea control Navy. Now, in 1996, 95, there was a question of whether that was the case. Many analysts would say, I don't see it. They don't have the ability to protect fleets at sea, far distances out from China. Um, they, uh, their surface combatants need a lot of development, a lot of work. They don't have the endurance. So these are some of the arguments that were being made in the mid-90s. Now, depending on how you make this argument depends on how you would characterize some of these different types of navies. So if you look at Chinese naval modernization and the question of what strategy guides it, I would say that there are probably four different possibilities. A global power projection navy, a regional sea control power projection navy, a sea denial navy, or something else, maybe a hybrid mix, that's very hard for we Westerners to discern or figure out, that there's something that is, uh, has elements of all of the above. Now, I've written all the different characteristics of the different types of navies. I said, all right, here's what, here's what, if you're trying to put together a global power projection navy, this is what it looks like. To me, the most important question with regard to that is your ability to sustain yourself, to be able to operate long distances out to sea for long periods of time, and you need to be able to protect yourself far from home. Um, to me, that's a, a, and then a, the endurance of your, of your surface combatants and your ability to operate far. And, uh, additionally, everyone has argued you need an aircraft carrier. You need the ability to go out, project power, and then protect yourself with air power out, in, out at sea. A smaller version of that would apply to a regional navy. You would need less logistic support and the ability to sustain yourself within the Asia Pacific, but, the, but it would be a smaller t-shirt version of a global blue water power projection navy. A sea denial navy, similar to say the risk fleet that we, we know about from, from the German effort to put the British Navy at risk, would essentially be designed to make the US Navy think twice about intervening in Chinese affairs. And for, for many years in the 90s, many analysts felt that that's what the Chinese Navy was about, that is preventing the US from intervening in Chinese affairs. But by and large, it's a Navy designed to increase the risk to the US Navy's ability to operate within, within the Asia Pacific. And then finally, the, the last one, the, the option number four, is a mix. And I'll explain what that is uh, as we go along with this presentation. All right, so let's take a look at Chinese force structure over time. So uh, I don't know if you, is it hard to see in the back there? But nonetheless, the first, uh, the first thing we need to look at are what the Chinese have brought online over the last 20, 25 years. In 1996, I was part of a delegation that went to Beijing right around the time the Chinese were firing ballistic missiles around Taiwan, and I went with an official CNA, Department of Navy delegation to Beijing and to Shanghai to have discussions with the Chinese because we had just had a real rocky uh, 95 and 96. And so we were, went there. Part of that trip involved ship visits. So 
I was able to go with a delegation on board some of these ships. And the ship they picked for us was the Ludoc class guided missile destroyer. So as a young pup analyst that I was walking around, I didn't know what I was seeing, but I was surrounded by individuals, retired 06s, retired flag officers, who immediately were, pointing, were immediately noticing things about that ship. And later on as we huddled, they said, hmm, interesting. Open bridge, I said, OK, that certainly reduces your survivability. Um, and he said, and, and I've noticed also when we were walking around the Luda, that Captain Bro uh, uh, Linton Brooks, some of you who may, may know him, retired, uh, retired 06, but then a, a former Assistant Secretary of Energy, I believe, was his position in the GW Bush administration. But, but Linton was walking around on the bridge, and he grabbed his hand on the chair, and he's rolling it around. He's, in fact, he pushed it. He pushed it across the bridge, and he said, very interesting. And I was like, OK, I don't know what that means. He goes, just imagine you're sitting around the bridge, and all of a sudden, an incoming missile hits. You're the captain sitting on the chair. What happens? So they were pointing out a number of different things with regard to that, with regard to that ship. Uh, and then, uh, most importantly, the, the air defense missile system, the radars on, on that ship. So in 95, 96, Couple of observations. China had a navy that was not able to defend large areas of itself with its, uh, with its air defenses. Point defense system, missiles can come flying in, and you might be able to defend a single ship with what they had, but very little capability to defend wide areas. Hence, not much of a navy that could operate too far from China. You would, you would need your, uh, to, to operate relatively close to shore. What this slide tells you, Gradual uh, procurement of, and in addition, you'll notice that the Luda destroyer is not even listed there. You could push it to the left and say, they pr we can pretty much write off that capability. Lu Hu, Lu Hai, Lu Yang, Lu Yang 2, Lu Zhou, Lu Yang 3. These are, this is China uh, acquiring, developing, and building off of the Lu Hu destroyer and building off of that capability, increasing their ability. So by the time you get to the Lu Yang 3, later, uh, 2010, 2014 time frame with the ability to protect uh, with a phased array radar and the ability to fire missiles further out, China has arguably developed the capability to defend its ships at sea. Submarine commissionings. In the mid-90s, early to mid-90s, they're, they're, one, they're one class of SSNs, their attack submarines, particularly noisy. The Han class our submariners would say you could pick them out a mile away, you know, miles away. Not particularly effective if, you're, if the purpose of a submarine is stealth operations and the ability to, to sail around and conduct operations without necessarily being seen. Well, the Chinese have been, over the last 25 years, working on that. Their Shan class is much quieter. And their, their one SSBN class that they had, the Xia class, which actually never even did a, a formal deterrence patrol, you can write that off, but the Jin class SSBN has come online just recently. So China has uh, an SSBN deterrent capability, and their diesel capabilities are, are, are also vastly improving. So you can also see that, that amongst naval analysts, they say, well, amongst diesel submarines, having an air-independent propulsion capability is absolutely vital to it. That allows you to, to regenerate your batteries without snorkeling, and you can stay out further. So the Chinese capabilities have certainly improved in their submarine acquisitions and in their surface, their uh, destroyer acquisitions. Same thing with frigates. All right, we can make the same argument. The, the frigates that they've got, uh, larger, more stable, better weapon systems, better sensors. So everything right now is pointing to a Chinese Navy that is, that is improving and that what our naval experts would say, that's a Navy that's able to operate further from shore and can protect itself. I want, I want to highlight the, this lower part of this graph, which is the upper part um, in the 90s. You can see that, that that's the sheer numbers haven't really changed that much. But what's changed is the modernization of the force. That is, you could have said in 1995, 94, that the Chinese had you know, 40, 50, diesel attack submarines, but well, those were Romeo class, much noisier, 
Um, what this, I'm sorry, what, what this bottom part of the slide shows is sort of the percentage that are considered modern by our naval experts. And you can see that they moved from 7% of their diesel attack submarines in the year 2002 to 75% by the present. So China has been spending a great deal of time in the last quarter of a century modernizing its naval capabilities. So you now have quite a modern uh, navy. Um, other, some other factoids, it's the second largest navy in the world after the United States. And now it's much more modern. So there's something to be said for what Admiral McDevitt, Bud Cole, Patrick Cronin, and James Holmes had to say, which is we've got our hand, on our hands on the verge of a sea control navy that we're going to have to contend with. Okay, I agree with that. But the question I always ask, I'm always at conferences with these guys, and I always say, well, what are they going to do with these things? What's the purpose of having a sea control navy that's able to control or be able to operate in the Indian Ocean? What is the purpose? You can, so on the one hand, you can interpret that ominously, or you can, or you can interpret it not ominously. Well, yeah, we've got this range of different th threats that could be posed against the United States, but I want to get at the strategy. What is it that the Chinese are actually trying to do with this capability? What is it that they're trying to do? And to me, that's an insufficiently answered question. Yes, they've got a sea control, emerging sea control capability, but what are they doing with it? And, and when we look at Chinese behavior today, what does that suggest they're doing? Here's why I think we can't simply say, sea control Navy, they're out to essentially push the United States off of our hill. So to me, there's, there's little bits of evidence that, will, that point that there's something more going on here. Unfi unfinished business. Please, by the way, this is, this, these numbers are wrong. This is the combined amphibious force is about 40 to 50 in that time frame. I, I just wasn't smart enough as a, as a um, PowerPoint ranger, I guess the term, to, to come up with a better uh, uh, ability to merge it or make that slide look fancier than it is. But that's, that's a total amphibious force of about 40 to 50. Um, but look at this. You've got a combined LST, LPD, and LSM for, uh, LST and LPD force of about 30 ships, right? Uh, four of those are LPD, which is their more modern landing platform dock. So if you look at the US Navy, our San Antonio class LPD is roughly the size of the, it's actually a little bit larger than China's um, class of landing platform dock. If you talk to the US Navy, they'll say four LPDs does not buy you much. It's not able to land anything near, anywhere near a division. I don't even think you can land, you can land probably a battalion with, with that number of, uh, but to me the bigger question is, China had the ability to just crank out LSTs. All right, if you, if you, you know, LST to me is the king. You can drive those things from mainland China right over to Taiwan, which is about 100, uh, a little less than 100 nautical miles, and just park them on the beach. I mean, if you just think about the number of LSTs required for a, a Normandy invasion, the Chinese could simply have replicated that. They could have modernized them, made them better, and you can just throw tanks and everything on it. To me, that would have been the king to solving the Taiwan problem. But no, that's not what they did. You're seeing a relatively static amphibious force for most of the 21st century. They did not go, and they could have done it. They had the technical capability, and they could have just spit out LSTs right and left. It's certainly not beyond their technical capability. Instead, they start focusing on longer range landing platform ships, LPD, rumors about an LHD. Those are longer range expeditionary capabilities that have larger purposes. They are leaving, so to me, why leave the Taiwan mission alone when that to me is the most, if you're trying, so in other words, if the bottom line is, is you're going global, you need to settle things at home first, right? They can, every analyst I know says Taiwan serves as a linchpin to this, right? If they don't control Taiwan and, they're, and all of a sudden they're in a global conflict with the United States, we have access to an ability to just project power into China. So the fact that the Chinese have left Taiwan alone. Now, obviously, we, we can talk about why. I mean, obviously, the purpose of this, this lecture is to talk about what the reasoning behind it is. But to me, this is a... This is a clue, the fact that, that they've left one of their most important missions undone. Second, 
yes, they're, they're investing in lots of out of area power projection capabilities, but they're also investing uh, a lot in, in coastal defense. So you look at their missile patrol coastals, they're still, they're st this is actually more of a reflection of modernization, getting rid of their fast attack craft and replacing them with, with more modern catamaran, uh, stealthy types of uh, patrol coastals. But also the sudden interest in corvettes, which allows them to assert their, uh, their maritime sovereignty rights in their exclusive economic zones in the South China Sea. So they're involving themselves in missions that I would say if, you're a, uh, if your focus is on global power projection, why are they messing around with the Spratly Islands, right? Why are you, uh, so you've got two options here. Either you develop a capability to say, we're going to completely settle the reg our regional problems, which means either one of two things. You develop the ability to land, uh, you, you do a repeat of the Imperial Navy in Japan, which is landings in the Philippines, Singapore, and you essentially control all of that territory to allow you to project power out, or you make sure that your political relationships with the countries in that region are absolutely calm, as tranquil as possible. Why then are they getting into little cat fights and, and arguments with the countries in the Asia Pacific? The fact that they're getting in these little rows with Singapore and with Indonesia and with Malaysia and with the Philippines and Vietnam. So, so to me, something Something doesn't quite sound right, okay, again. Next. A lot of our analysts are saying, yeah, this is a, this is a power projection, long distance sustainment navy. Is it? All right, to do this, you've got to sustain your, capa your, your naval forces out beyond the first and second island chains, out in the Indian Ocean for long periods of time. If you look at the comparison, US Navy Combat Logistics Force and where China is, they're nowhere near the capability to do that. Now, you can make the argument that they can spit, spit out a, an underway replenishment ship once a year and that in no time they'll have that capability. True, probably. But over a 20 year time frame, the fact that they only have eight of these things tells me that that, that was not first and foremost on their minds. Second, the number of uh, attack submarines that they have, nuclear attack, you would need a much greater number if you're trying to take on a superpower globally. Um, and the fact that they're still, they're still um, obtaining what I would say is more of a regional navy, sea denial type of navy, diesel subs that can hide and then make the United States think twice about coming in, means that this, this is a much more complicated question than China is, and then finally the SSBNs. That is too small of a force in my opinion to take on the United States if we're in a superpower confrontation. The same can be said, and I'll expand this, expand this presentation to talk about China's military force structure. They've got about 300 ICBMs to our however, however many thousands we have. So there is a strategy going on here that is not as simple as we normally make the argument. This is a challenging strategy, which I will talk about, but it is not as simple and straightforward as we often make the claim that it is. All right, so what's going on here? What's, what's Dr. Young's thesis for what, what, uh, what's going on? Uh, I'm sorry, for, I'm sorry for, for this busy slide, but um, and I think I've made most of these arguments. So if China's going global, it's going to take care of its near seas inner, inside Asia mission first, primarily Taiwan, and they haven't done that. They've, just, they've left Taiwan out as, now they're, we'll talk about what they're doing about that, but by and large, if China was really concerned about we're gonna go global and we're taking the United States on, they're certainly not gonna be leaving Taiwan alone. That would've been the first order of business. We need to corral Taiwan in and fast, and we need to make sure that this, this does not become a geographical liability to China. Um, still putting a lot of resources into their coastal, their coastal capabilities, and then here's what I think is most important. If China were trying to go global, they would really need to focus on their logistics capabilities. And now here's where we get into different arguments about what the purpose of some of their investments in, in Gwadar and other uh, uh, commercial facilities are. And if you go online, you'll often see, if you Google my name, you'll see me getting into in the little uh, arguments with other professors about this question, where I'll say, you know, okay, you guys are worried about China having access to Gwadar and all these different commercial facilities, but 
okay, that gives them greater political influence and they can, it gives them the ability to operate further out. But if in a real shooting war in the Indian Ocean, this just doesn't do it. You've got to have a full-fledged base, all right? And right now we don't have that. And then I've, you know, when I teach a class on the subject, I often ask my students this question, some of them logisticians, and I ask the question, hey, how many of you out there are engineers? And there's usually, there's usually one or two. I'll say, all right, if I wanted to turn a commercial facility into a full-fledged military naval facility where you're able to operate out of and project power out of, how long would that take? Would that take three months? Would that take a year? And they'd say more than a year, certainly a couple of years, and we could see it coming. So in other words, if this is the strategy China is, for, is following, they will be telegraphing their punch for years out. That is, all of a sudden we start seeing things being put in Gwadar or in these commercial facilities. From the intelligence perspective, you're watching these things happen, you're like, looks like the Chinese are starting to build a facility which will allow them to operate out of that facility. So they project their, they're telegraphing their punch. Additionally, I'd also point out one other thing. All of these facilities are well within Indian missile and air, modern aircraft range. So let's dump a whole bunch of modern naval service combatants, including an aircraft carrier, within range of miss, Indian missiles. And let's start a fight with the Indians so that the Indians can take these things out like that. So to me, this doesn't make logical sense as a, as a strategic objective for China. Now, I'm perfectly willing to say that China will use these facilities to, to project power out and through the Indian Ocean, but not necessarily to take on the Indians in a full-fledged conventional war. So they will use these things for other reasons, and we'll talk about what those potential missions are. Um, okay, but does this suggest that China is going for a regional navy also? And I would argue that no, it, it, that it doesn't seem like China is just developing a navy capability to dominate the region. Again, Taiwan would fall into, into, into place there. And in addition, China has not focused on the naval capabilities to take on the other major navies of the region. So their ASW is still poor. So Japan would give them, certainly give them a run for their money. And certainly Japan allied to the United States would, it would be seriously in doubt whether China could actually take on Japan and, China, and the United States in a regional conflict. So I'm starting to see evidence that the Chinese haven't put all of their eggs in the regional Navy basket either. Well then, have we now retreated to the sea denial Navy, which we argued were, was the case in the 1990s? Well, that's not, that's not accurate also because despite the fact that, the, that you've got large numbers of diesel submarines and capabilities to make the United States think twice, most notable is the anti-ship ballistic missile, which the Chinese are said to have, which is the ability to target a carrier with a ballistic missile that can then re-enter re or re-target from, you know, after being fired. The ultimate asymmetric weapon. So despite the, the evidence of all this, we still see evidence of China operating out of area. Expeditionary uh, operations in the Gulf of Aden to deal with counter piracy operations. Um, submarine activity in the Indian Ocean. So I would argue that my thesis is it's a mix. There's something else going on in China's strategy that is not as simple as the first three uh, hypotheses I argued. It's not a global navy that they're shooting for. It's not a regional navy. It's not a sea denial navy. It's a mixture of the above to accomplish certain political objectives that the Chinese have laid out for themselves. All right, now what is that? So what are Chinese strategic objectives? So if you go and talk to the Chinese military, as I've done a, quite a bit, you ask them, what is it, how do you view the security environment of the world? How do you look at it over the next 20 years? And every time you talk to the Chinese military or Chinese scholars, they'll say, we're in a period of strategic opportunity. And then you say, well, what does that mean? And then after uh, about an hour or two of kabuki dancing and, and trying to unravel exactly what that means, uh, and when I say this, it's me and the assistant military attache and the naval attache asking the Chinese this question, ultimately it comes down to this. China looks at the world as being created by the United States. The U.S. created this world. It's a, it's a U.S.-led international order. This U.S.-led international order has benefited China. China has grown 10%, had grown 10% over 30 years. The Chinese see that as a good thing. They can continue to grow 
at 10 percent. Well, they can continue to grow, not at the 10 percent level. So the, the Chinese will say a period of strategic opportunity essentially means that we get to free ride off of you guys for a bit longer. You're, if, there's a, if there's a fire, uh, a brush fire in the Middle East, we know the United States will respond to that, even though China has a great deal of, of interest in the Middle East, access to energy, raw materials. We know if there's a problem in the Middle East, you'll take care of it. If there's a terrorist problem, Afghanistan, South Asia, Central Asia, we know the United States will take care of it. By and large, the Chinese are saying, we're going, to free, we're going to free ride off of you guys for a little bit longer. We're going to continue economically developing, building up our military capability, while you guys spend blood and treasure and bleed yourselves while we continue to do this. Um, and then you ask them, well, what's your end objective? Well, our end objective is by 2020, we're a moderately modern society by 2020. That's only a few years away. But we're a fully-fledged modern socialist state by 2050. Now, let's, let's put this in context. Uh, when they say moderately developed economic country, they're talking about having a GDP per capita of, of say, a Belgium or a France. For 1.5 billion people, that's a gigantic economy. That's a huge economy. But that's their objective. Their, their objective is, we think that every, now, if you've ever been to China, you can see Beijing, Shanghai, is just like going to New York City. Almost the same. I mean, I'm from New York City, and I'm willing to make that, make that, that argument. But you travel inland, and all of a sudden, you feel like you're in, you're, it's Pearl Buck country, right? The Chinese, when they say, we want a per capita GDP of roughly Belgium, France, or a medium-sized European country, that is a gigantic economy, and that means uh, all of every, you know, everyone's wealth has been, they're in pretty good shape. Um, so strategically, what does this mean? For now, preserve the current international order. If the U.S. needs help in some areas, give it to them. If North Korea is causing trouble saying we're just fired off a ballistic missile and, we're, and we've got nukes, and the United States says we need, a, we need to declare a sanction against North Korea, join in. If the United States says we think it's best that we sign some sort of deal with Iran, help the United States do that. In fact, the Chinese were instrumental in helping the State Department and our negotiators come to an agreement with Iran. If there's some sort of global problem, climate change, you name it, the Chinese, for the most part, have jumped in if they see it as in their interest. Perfect, another perfect example. I don't know if you know this, but, there, but right now, drift net fishing in the North Pacific is a problem that both countries don't like. The United States says this depletes our fisheries. The Chinese say it depletes our fisheries. We rely on fish. On fish. So there's a program right now where there, you've got a United States Coast Guard cutter sailing around the North Pacific with Chinese Coast Guardsmen on that cutter. And when they intercept bad guys, usually Chinese, the Chinese Coast Guardsmen are there to, to do the, the prosecution, arrest, and all the legal stuff. This is a program that exists between Chi the Chinese Coast Guard and the US Coast Guard. So there are areas of cooperation between the two uh, capabilities. I think the best phrase that will summarize Chinese strategy is, why buy the whole loaf when you can get three slices for free? That is why the Chinese, and the Chinese will come out and say this, why, when you guys argue that you're gonna, we're going to knock you off the hill, why would we do that? If there's a forest fire in the Middle East, you expect us to send an expeditionary force taking shots from terrorists. Oh, and by the way, by doing that, we're going to invite terrorists into China when stability is our number one Right? We just heard of it. I don't know if you read in the paper. An explosion in Jiangsu province, kindergarten. I think seven kids or whatever. Uh, children casualties. This is China's worst nightmare. So the Chinese are, are going to be very careful about what their footprint in the world is going to be. And so I would argue that, that their ultimate objective is to ultimately dominate the Asia Pacific region like they had in the past. And their view on global strategy is something else, which I'll talk about in a minute. But it is not, in my opinion, we, we want the whole enchilada, or to use another Asian ethnic food comparison, we don't want the whole egg roll. All right? the, the Chinese are going to be thinking very carefully about what their strategic role in the world is in relation to the United States. So how do they go about doing this? So given this objective, what do they do? They're going to accomplish this objective without a direct confrontation with the United States. 
they know that in a direct confrontation with the United States, one of two things happens. One thing is certainly going to happen. The world economy takes a hit. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen estimates that GDP will, at a minimum, drop 4%, global GDP. All right? That's massive unemployment for not only for China, but for us. So no matter how a global conflict or a conflict with the United States is, is it's going to have an effect on the economy. That's, that's a hit to the China, Chinese. That's a hit to us. Um, all right, Taiwan. Taiwan remains an important strategic objective of China. Ch the Chinese say this is, an un this is unfinished business. Ch Taiwan is part of China. It, it remains part of this century and a half of humiliation in which imperial powers carved up, imperial powers and Japan carved up China, and Taiwan remains out of our reach. It is our political objective to get Taiwan back into the fold. No general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party can allow Taiwan to escape. If, if Taiwan declares independence and is able to get away with it, that general secretary of the party is done. His, his political career is over. So the Chinese will say, all right, so how do we do this without necessarily getting embroiled in a, co a conflict with the United States? Well, the answer is they gradually fold Taiwan in. And all their actions are not to, to provoke a confrontation with the US, but to gradually fold Taiwan back in. And we'll talk about what they're going to do in order to make that happen. South China Sea disputes, same thing. China, China will say, listen, these maritime territories belong to China. So it's a domestic political problem for them. These territories in the South China Sea and in the East China Sea belong to China. The, again, no general secretary of the party is going to survive allowing one, any of those territories to get either seized, obtained by, you name the rival country, Vietnam, Philippines, et cetera. So that is, that's one of their red lines. But they will say, we don't have the ability to solve this, not as long as the United States is present in the region. They have the ability to bully, coerce, and cause countries to think twice about being provocative. But right now, they lack the capability to just settle this militarily. So again, they're going to do this by gradually, now when I say on this slide, it says maintain status quo plus. That means that they'll essentially try and keep things the same, but if another country does something provocatively, China re responds relatively forcefully and leaves that other country stinging and in a worse position. Case number one, Scarborough Shoal. Philippines try to arrest Chinese fishermen. China responds with large numbers of China maritime surveillance ships, and ultimately, when everyone backs off, China was left uh, present on Scarborough Shoal. The Philippines will think twice. Well, the Philippines now with Duterte, it's another completely different dynamic. But the Philippines and any of these countries are going to think twice about provoking China in the South China Sea. The other, the wild card, though, through all this is American interference. The US can interfere in a number of different ways both on Taiwan and in the South China Sea. And so the, the Chinese are going to continually have to deal with making the United States think twice about operating in, in this area. So one of their other objectives, or one of the other ways they're going to go about doing this is to say, all right, how do we completely or continuously increase the cost for the United States to operate within this area? Um, finally, China has interests abroad. They are trying to continue their economic development. They have interests in the Middle East. They have interests in Central Asia, South Asia. They have interests in making money and getting raw materials and bringing those raw materials back. And so the Chinese, and, and, and in conjunction with those increased economic out-of-area interests come security interests. Piracy attacks, terrorist attacks, destruction of Chinese property, Countries collapsing with citizens suddenly there. So the Chinese have to come up with a strategy to deal with out-of-area operations or interests far from China. So and then finally, if we're talking about a long-term competition with the United States in which the United States may act in a way that is not in conformity with China's long-term interests, they have to take into account the possibility that the US gets coercive with, with our nuclear weapons capability. So whatever their strategy is, they have to come up with a means to address the fact that we have thousands of nuclear weapons, and they do not. They've had to think through that issue. So given that that's the general approach, how, 
How has that affected their maritime strategy? And so given that I've sort of laid out their, their strategic objectives, do we see anything in their behavior in the maritime domain which would seem to suggest that these actions in the maritime domain are supporting the strategy that I've laid out? All right, Taiwan problem. So continuously develop a military capability to conduct a full-scale assault on the island, but don't quite get there yet. And so, so, get, so yes, I pointed to that slide which showed a steady number of, of assault ship capability, but they're gradually in, putting into that force modernized capabilities. So an LPD is still a much more modern ship than an LST. Um, and continually develop, uh, they're getting air cushion landing craft like our Navy, they're, they're getting LCACs. Increasing the size of the PLA Marine Corps, they're going from 20,000 to roughly 100,000 Marines. I, now I think most of those Marines will be used for operations outside of the Asia Pacific, but by and large that's a signal. And in addition there are things going on in terms of joint military reform in China which moves them towards a better ability to deal with Taiwan. Um, develop capabilities to increase the pressure on Taiwan, increase coercion, and therefore the Chinese have been practicing and developing the, uh, uh, the ability to blockade Taiwan if they need to. And they, um, they're continuously developing the ballistic missile capability in, to coerce Taiwan, to be able to strike airfields, ports, and other things. And they will, what they'll do is they'll fire these uh, on targets on mainland China to indicate, by the way, we're continuing to practice in case Taiwan decides to do something against China's interests. In, in addition, you will see things like they'll create a, an entire complete mock-up of the presidential palace on Taiwan, and then they'll assault it with their special forces. If that isn't a signal that they're trying to be coercive, I don't know what is. Um, and then exercises. The Chinese have been repeatedly doing exercises just to show you know, if we needed to do this, we can do it. And so every year they'll put on very large scale amphibious assault exercises, parading out capabilities to show that, that hey, we are continually developing this. And then, additionally, continuously developing anti axis area denial capabilities. I don't know if you all are familiar with the A2AD uh, term, but anti axis area denial, which is actually American terminology imposed on Chinese strategy. The Chinese term is more counter-intervention or uh, uh, strategy. And so the Chinese will de be developing this capability, the diesel submarines with air independent propulsion capability that, that I presented before, that falls into that category. Anti-ship ballistic missile falls into that category. Maritime strategy number two, their activity and actions in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. So they are gradually changing facts on the ground, expanding uh, poor, uh, airfields on some of the islets they have, deepening some of the harbors, um, and then doing what we would call gray zone operations. They are taking actions which are short of, of, uh, of thresholds that Pacific Command and US military would consider the need that we would need to respond militarily. So they're acting in, ve in very discreet ways that are putting pressure on the rival claimants, but don't trigger any military responses from the United States. And so, for example, they will send in their China Maritime Surveillance Force, not their Navy, to bully, push, and coerce the other navies. And then when the, na when the other navies respond, the Chinese will say, hey, we're just, tr we're just enforcing our maritime laws. And, you'll, and in fact, actually a, chi a Chinese analyst actually responded this way to me when I asked him this question, but he said, look, we, look how the Philippines responded with a frigate. They responded with a navy. We've already won the public relations battle. We showed up with police forces. They show up with a navy. Now, of course, their police forces with their gigantic uh, Coast Guard cutters, it's, you know, so apples and oranges. Um, so the Chinese have developed a strategy to manage, gradually exert coercive power on the region, on the other claimants of, the, of South China Sea and East China Sea. Um, declaration of an air defense identification zone is another example of that, where, they, where they're hinting, hey, if, if, if aircraft fly through this area, we, you know, we may need to intercept that aircraft. Um, so nonetheless, the Chinese have developed a, a gradual means to deal with this problem. They're not, they're not confronting the US, they're trying to gradually change facts on the ground. 
And ultimately, what, what I think will happen is, as if the US can't come up with effective responses to these, to these actions, our credibility goes down. That is, a Vietnam, a Philippines, a Malaysia will say, well, what good is the US military if they can't respond effectively to Chinese bullying? And that's the point. The Chinese will say, we're here. The US isn't going to be here forever. And oh, by the way, even when the US is here, they're not able to do anything about it. So over time, this is going to erode our, uh, the American ability to, to either get the countries to side with us, um, and it will also deprive, it may deprive us of, of access to facilities if the countries say, no, we're not going to help you because you guys can't seem to effectively deal with the Chinese. Chinese are, are, are continuously developing capability to make the United States second think its, its presence in the region. I mentioned before the anti-ship ballistic missile. Well, that certainly has our Navy thinking, all right, if we're going to operate anywhere near Taiwan, are we going to have to worry about a ballistic missile that's able to target a carrier strike route? And yes, that will cause, individual, cause any military commander, PACOM, or even a ship's captain of a, of a carrier to think twice about it. It's diesel submarines. So putting them at strategic choke points and making us think about, all right, submarine in the water, we've got to sanitize this entire area before we can operate. Um, the, the fact that the Chinese have proliferated anti-ship cruise missiles on almost every Navy platform that they have, patrol coastal craft, destroyers, frigates, almost everything that they have, they put anti-ship cruise missiles on. That is certainly going to make um, any naval force think twice about operating freely uh, anywhere near the Chinese mainland. Um, and then their, their ballistic missiles, which can target all of our allies, and certainly the Chinese have subtly hinted, oh, by the way, Japan, you know, we certainly hope you're not going to directly um, get involved in a Taiwan contingency because, by the way, all those bases you've got there, which the U.S. would flow forces through, are targetable by us. So, so this becomes a very subtle coercive tactic by the Chinese use to say to try and deprive us of our ability to operate in the region. Now, uh, recently you may have heard the spat between China, Korea, and the United States over THAAD, the THAAD missile system in Korea. So from a U.S. perspective, you know, we're sort of puzzled. Why do the Chinese, this is us helping an ally deal with a North Korean missile, ballistic missile and nuclear threat. Why are the Chinese making such a fuss of this thing? To include the Chinese saying, we're going to cut off tourism, we're going to really put the screws to South Korea. Well, you can interpret it this way. The Chinese are thinking in terms of what's our capability to make the United States think twice about operating in the region, our ballistic missile capabilities. If we get a THAAD system and the South Koreans cooperating with Japan, cooperating with Taiwan, cooperating with the United States, the U.S. ultimately can develop some sort of regional networked missile defense that, allow, that allows ISR data, um, satellite tracking data to then be shared amongst one another. So the China, what the Chinese are saying is, is yeah, we, we hear all the arguments about how the THAAD system is pointed at North Korea, not at China. But they're thinking long term. They're saying, ultimately, we don't want some sort of network missile defense system that will uh, ultimately reduce our ability to coerce the countries in the region. And ultimately, will uh, we'll make the United States think twice about operating here. That's, what, that's how you should interpret the sad fight. Now, this is, this is the, the activities and actions the Chinese are doing out of the area is most interesting because people will say, well, what does all this activity in the Indian Ocean, the Gulf of Aden, what does, uh, do you guys know what the One Belt, One Road is? Okay, so One Belt, One Road is the Chinese throwing $1 trillion, maybe more, at infrastructure, investment developments in Central Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and in this one big gigantic infrastructure development program going from Asia to Europe. Right? So in my mind, this is the Chinese saying, we have interests abroad, and the best way to, to protect those interests is to, uh, and oh, by the way, we also have economic interests. And one, one of the problems we have is we're running out of markets. So let's create our own market. We're going to build up and develop Central Asia, the Middle East, et cetera. We're going to throw tons of money. Uh, and this is actually picking up steam. You know, when this first came out a few years ago, many analysts said, I don't know, you know if this is reality or if this is just the Chinese putting up posters and saying, yeah, this is the, the wave of the future. Well, this is, this is reality. The Chinese are throwing everything but the kitchen sink at this thing. Well, that plus their desire to protect petroleum and other raw materials coming from the Middle East 
and other parts of the world means that the Chinese have to protect these interests. This has a number of security implications. It means that when a country collapses abroad, like Libya or Yemen, the Chinese have to respond to that. They, they, they know it, and I've talked with the Chinese military, and they've said, yes, this is no longer a situation where we can say, yes, yeah, so we lost 30,000 citizens in Libya. It's a political problem. They cannot let that go, so therefore they have to develop the military capability to protect those citizens or get them out. So, so certainly at a minimum what you're going to see is an evolving NEO capability, the ability to do a non-combatant evacuation operation. You're going to see the ability to do humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. You're going to see Chinese uh, uh, special forces and ground forces in other countries doing counterterrorism and other, other missions to protect Chinese property and in conjunction with a host nation invitation. So the, the and how do we know this? Because the Chinese passed a law two years ago which said if a country uh, uh, suffers from some sort of terrorist attack and invites China to help, China, we authorize the Chinese military to be able to conduct operations abroad. Despite our previous objections to Chinese troops operating in foreign territory, we now give the authorization to make that happen. Another data point, when China gets together for joint military exercises with Russia, and all the Central Asian governments in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization exercises, the scenario is invariably large-scale terrorist attack, country asks assistance, China, Russia, other countries then flow in capabilities to stabilize the situation. That's the model of future Chinese operations outside of China. So what we're seeing is China saying, okay, we have specific interests abroad that we need to protect within the umbrella of a larger U.S. presence in the region and the U.S. likelihood to be responding to these things also, we need to identify closely what our interests are and develop a military capability to do that within this larger structure. And they have to do it without necessarily having the United States say, hey, what's this? What is, what is this capability? And a perfect example of that is the carrier. Now let's get back to that. Chinese have two aircraft carriers now the sea control guys will say, oh my God, we're talking about, uh, as, my, as my old mentor, Admiral McGevitt, says, I, geez, I'm not sure if, we're, if the Chinese are trying to replicate the Imperial Japanese Navy. He could be right. But I could also interpret that as in, we have a sea lines of communication problem in the Indian Ocean, and there ain't no way we're going to rely on the United States to protect our shipping. So we are going to create pipelines and other capabilities through One Belt, One Road to make sure our flow of raw materials and petroleum comes into China, but a huge amount goes by sea, and there's no way we're going to allow the United States, India, or any other countries to cut off, cut off that flow. And so we need to have, as an insurance policy, the ability to protect that shipping. So they're going to develop a nascent and so I see, I see projections, four, maybe four air, uh, aircraft carriers to six. Well, that's just enough to do uh, an Indian Ocean sea lines of communication slot protection mission. And the Chinese will say to you, and we've asked them this directly, they'll say, yeah, it has two implications here. So if we're in a conflict with you, right, and we're in a conflict with India, we have to have this capability. If we're not in a conflict with you, we have to have this capability. So we are going to be pushing for development because well, either way, we're going to need to develop this capability. We would hope that we can cooperate with India and the United States. And we will, if you guys have, if the Indians and the Australians and the Japanese invite us again in their quadrilateral exercise that they do to participate in a SLOC protection exercise, we'll participate. So to me, this is an open question. And finally, uh, nuclear deterrence. So before I'd said, they're going to have six SSBNs. That's, that's certainly insufficient for a slugging match with the United States over strategic weaponry, right? But I think the six SSBNs, if they're good, combined with the, the, the hundreds that they have of ICBMs abroad, falls in line with Chinese nuclear doctrine, which is secure second strike. That is, they don't, they don't have a nuclear war fighting doctrine. They don't believe in MAD. What they're doing is they're saying, we want the ability to keep the United States from coercing us. We want freedom of maneuver to coerce the countries in the region to politically dominate the Asia Pacific, and we want the US to gradually back out. And we think six SSBNs, or whatever number, plus however small number of ICBMs they have 
ground-based, should do the trick. I mean, that's the doctrine they've been living under for a few decades now, and I think the SSBN development gives them a, enhances their secure second strike. So, um, so what's the conclusion and final thoughts on this? So what you're seeing is you're seeing an elements of all of the navies I talked about. There are elements of a blue water navy, there are elements of a regional sea control navy, there are elements of a sea denial navy, and there are elements of a whole mix of different things. If it, this mix makes sense if you look at their strategic objectives. What is it they're after? How are they trying to do it? And the answer is they're trying to do it gradually over time without necessarily having a direct confrontation with the US. And they're trying to do it to head off certain contingencies that they're afraid of and worried about. And so to me, the force structure makes sense um, given um, the strategies they're trying to accomplish. I would also point out another thing too. I wouldn't be surprised if 10, 15, 20 years from now, the Chinese, and this is, uh, to me, I think this is, um, a, this is very typical Chinese. They don't, I know it's popular, it's popular to say China, the Chinese think strategically. They can think 100, 200 years out. Yes, they do think strategically, but the Chinese also have a habit of, of, of saying, all right, what are we going to be like in five years? Okay, we think this is where we're going to be. Well, in the five-year mark, let's look around, and let's see if we need to course correct. And then in 10 years, let's look around, let's course correct. If in 10, 15, 20 years, the Chinese sit there and say, uh, uh, I mean, a big question is, where is the United States going to be in 20 years? What's our po global posture going to be? If the United States is not a four global postured superpower that's protecting the international order, which is possible, the Chinese may conclude we need to step up because the U.S. is back down. If we are a globally forward postured power that's much more vigorous and much more active, the Chinese will say, may say, okay, let's, re let's think of it. Let's think about how we're going to interact with the United States. So I would argue that this is not a written script. This is still to be played out. And a lot of it has to do with what we end up doing. So with that, let me conclude and let me take your questions. I'm sure you may have, you may have many. And in addition, let me just point out something else. I, I've given a specific presentation on Chinese maritime strategy and their force structure, but I, my, um, my expertise is pretty much just on any type of Chinese strategic issue. So if you want to uh, go off on that, um, and other question is fine as well. Thank you. I have the microphone. Questions? Dr. Young, thanks for, uh, for coming today and uh, speaking to us. You had mentioned uh, different techniques to coerce uh, neighbors in the region, and you were talking about uh, Philippines with Scarborough Shoals. Is there an economic component where there's uh, fresh goods or uh, foodstuffs coming from the Philippines to China? Is that part of China's uh, strategy to... Uh, other neighbors. Uh, yeah, there, there is there is definitely an economic component to this as well. In fact, in fact, um, in previous spats between the Philippines and China, China has pulled that card out, where they've said no more bananas and other fruits from the Philippines. Let's cut up, let's cut off tourist um, visits to the Philippines. Um, uh, I have done some work on what those instruments and tools are, um, and in fact, China is not alone in doing that. So the Philippines also pulls out certain instruments as well. But China uh, is, uh, has a voluminous toolkit that it uses to try and shape the environment. Legal, economic, informational, and it will, it will pull those out as necessary. And, and because of the nature of the Chinese government, it's much more coordinated. That is, you can, you can coordinate some of these actions in conjunction with one another. So, so economics is definitely part of their, um, their coercive toolkit, yes. Thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. Um, you said you were happy to uh, take some questions that go a little bit um, beyond maritime strategy itself. And I, and I wonder if you see analogies or a link uh, between what China is doing in its space programs and its counter space programs to its maritime strategy. Mm. Uh, so I'm. 
Space is definitely something I don't have a, a great deal of, of expertise in, but yeah, there, there are some analogies. Um, uh, I would say that because China is, is, a, is a budding, is a nascent space power, that you're seeing less, you're seeing less aggressive action, course of action, but that could change as China becomes much more capable. I would, um, I would point you to uh, a, a publication put out by the National Bureau of Asian Research called U.S.-China uh, Relations in Strategic Domains, which came out about a year ago. I, I was asked to write, and in this, in this publication, we were paired up with a Chinese author and analyst, and we're asked to write on our strategic interactions in different domains, and I was asked to write on the maritime domain. Brian Whedon, um, who's a China space guy, wrote a, a, a corresponding piece on uh, China and U.S. interactions in the space domain. So you can, you can read that to your heart's content in terms of the competition between China and the United States in that domain. And then there's also a, a cyber domain uh, chapter. There's also a, a PLA, military to military um, domain chapter, et cetera. So I would, I would, hi I would uh, highly recommend reading that one. Um, but, but again, to answer your question, yes, there, there's some similar behavior, but because they're, they're less further along, I would say that it's less competitive right now, less aggressive, I think. Hi, how you doing? Uh, Chris Pultz from uh, uh, Joint Military Attaché School. A uh, quick question for you. Um, one of the things you didn't mention in your in your presentation was the 2004 new his, new historic missions laid out yeah, by yeah. Hu Jintao as yeah. kind of the what I think is a, a shift in China's uh, direction, uh, PLA direction in terms of reorganization, restructuring, training, and then laying out one of the guidelines laid out in that was was the uh, protecting uh, China's economic interests. Do you not see that there is that perhaps what we're seeing is the, the is the kind of the fruition of this the new historic missions coming to life, finally being delivered by the PLA and in, 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 in finally uh, absolute, you know getting near that point where they can deliver that capability and how that no, relates to. No, no, I, abs I absolutely think that that. Uh, and I'm sorry I didn't insert the new historic missions in, in uh, a slide all its own, but I, I absolutely think that, that the new historic missions uh, uh, constitute sort of the, the thinking in terms of all right, what are the, what are the threats. You know, so the threats I laid out for you, the Chinese have sat down and said, all right, what, what is particularly threatening to us and how do we address these issues? And I think the new historic missions, which came out, I believe they were announced in 2007, or was it 2004? Okay. So 2004 was, again, an, a crystallization of, okay, so how do we direct the military to now accomplish these missions? So, so in contrast, I would highlight the new historic missions as being central to the Chinese thinking out this, uh, this strategy. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't present it, I mean, uh, give it the, the, uh, the, the fame and notoriety that it deserves. So uh, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. So. Sir, thank you for coming. Um, so I understand that the defense industry is a large part of any country's uh, general power. Um, so with uh, Chinese expansion of their global objectives, et cetera, and given that the defense industry and private security provides a large portion of, of that power, do you see any development with um, a private security industry within like the Chinese context with their new expansion of, of their expeditionary forces and global objectives? Uh, to be used similar in a way to we use as far as, you know, support functions or even logistic functions yeah, yeah. at Intel, et hey, Great question. Guess who was in China uh, maybe a month ago? Eric Prince was roaming around China talking about what? We don't know. Well, I think I can guess. What? Um, yeah, this is, all right, so let me, let me interpret something for you. You have one belt, one road. You have Chinese interests in territory outside of China. Politically, the Chinese have said, we will never put, we will never base large numbers of troops in foreign territory abroad. If we're invited by a host nation country, we'll, we'll take care of contingency operations, but we'll never post large numbers of troops um, because we get sucked. I mean, for whatever reason, the Chinese right now are thinking about getting around that political uh, landmine. It's, all right, we are going to have security interests to protect you know, we've got huge amounts of in investment going into these places. One possible answer is um, security, private security uh, force that they can hire, train, put in, and it becomes less of a political 
uh, landmine for China? Uh, and so that's a great question. It sort of gets to, this is, gets to what I'm trying to get at, which is the Chinese have specific interests of trying to narrowly, um, right? One, one response could be, well, just flow lots of troops in and you know, provide gigantic numbers of Chinese divisions to protect these things. Well, that's a political, from the Chinese perspective, that's, it's, uh, that's getting sucked into the local politics and making, makes China a gigantic target. The possibility of having private contractors roaming around who they could then say, now they would have the same political uh, problems we would have when we have large numbers of private contractors running around, but the Chinese are clearly thinking about this. So that's a great question because it sort of shows the Chinese are thinking about this question. How do we manage these out of area operations? One possibility is private security contractors, what have you. Another possibility which ha we, we don't see any evidence yet, and I'm the, probably the only China analyst who makes this argument. I think we're not far from a Chinese amphibious ready group marine expeditionary unit. That is, put, put Chinese ground troops on amphibious ships, sail them around, wave the flag, oh look, the Chinese argue pulling into, you name the port, the, you know, the Chinese buying, oh wait a minute, look, non-combatant evacuation operation, racing to the rescue. Humanitar I mean, our, our ARG Mews are, are perfect for that. Theirs would be too. So, I, so you heard it here first. I think that's on the horizon 10, 15 years down the road. I think we have time for one more question. Dr. Meyer. Thanks a lot <coughs> for that. Yeah, I can, I can. Can you flip the coin? How are the Japanese, the Filipinos, and the Koreans reacting to all of this? We've seen some increase in Japan uh, for a constitutional change or reinterpretation. But what's, what's the flip of the coin? OK, so the response has been varied across the region. So you, you've alluded to right there. So I think the, Jap the Japanese under uh, Abe have reacted very strongly. That is, they're seeing a threat, a rising threat, and they're trying to figure out a way to contend with that threat. And so for them, the first order of business is dealing with the constitutional limitations of working with the United States. So you had 2014-2015, uh, Prime Minister Abe working vigorously to get an interpretation of the Constitution to have Japanese self-defense forces uh, conduct collective self-defense. Now, it's hard to believe that an ally is not able, if United States ship or personnel attacked by a, a third party, the previous interpretation was Japan could not help in that instance. So let's pretend a, a Chinese submarine attacks a US vessel. The, the Japanese could render assistance, but they couldn't then intercept or do anything about that attack, unless it directly had something to do with Japan's defense. So Prime Minister Abe's first order of business was, this is, this is outdated, let's try and address uh, these, these constitutional limitations. So my view is Japan is, is seriously concerned about this and trying to do everything it can within its political restrictions to try and address this problem. Um, when I was in Japan just recently, a month ago, they were even talking about things like, you know, they're, 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 they're thinking about offensive strike missions in Korea, North Korea, because of the threat that North Koreans pose. So what we're seeing in Japan is a rethinking, at least under Prime Minister Abe, of Japan's role in its, its own defense, its relationship with the United States, how the self-defense forces see themselves and the roles that, that they see in uh, protecting for the defense of Japan. And that is going to require a lot of spade and shovel war, getting the, China, the Japanese population to, to then completely move out of 70 years of a pacifistic perspective. Um, so a good example of this is when Prime Minister Abe was trying to, to get the Constitution Reevaluated. I was at the Ministry of National Defense, and the Japanese, whose jobs it were, so senior officials whose jobs were to think about defense issues, were saying, "I know this is good for Japan. I know we need to rethink this, but I, geez, I'm having a, I'm having a psychological problem coming over this." So, so just imagine a DoD official whose job it is is to think about national security and defense, having to overcome sort of a, a psychological obstacle. So that's Japan. Korea is another matter entirely. The Koreans, what we've seen, is they voted out a relatively hawkish pro-national security party. Well, of course, that it's, it's more complicated than that. You had, a, you had the scandal going on in South Korea. 
But in place, they now have a relatively dovish uh, president who is now calling for um, a, re a renewal of the sunshine policy, talking with uh, North Korea again. So, so it's a mixed bag of responses. And Korea has always been caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, a, a, a strategic concern with China, and then an alliance relationship with the United States. So even under the best circumstances, Korean administrations are sort of knocked around and have to counterbalance two competing strategic objectives, keeping China relatively happy and quiet, uh, and, quiet and, and, and satisfying the demands of an alliance relationship with the US. So right now, the, the, the Koreans' tendency now is to say, OK, I think they're going to say, well, whatever we can do to keep China quiet uh, is going to be much more important. So that, their response is less hawkish than Japan's has been. And the Philippines, the Lord knows where they're going because of their, their current political situation. But their national security experts who I talk to will say, most, most national security experts don't necessarily agree with President Duterte and his, 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 his actions. We think that what we need to do is hunker down, have a closer relationship with the United States, like we were doing prior to the election of President Duterte, and that's the that's the correct uh, approach. Vietnam, same thing. Vietnam caught between uh, the, the uh, U.S. partnership and a, uh, and a threat to the North, and they're also trying to balance these two off. And they, to them, it's a it's a kabuki dance as well. So the different responses, there have been different responses in the region to. China's rise and how to deal with it. Please join me in uh, thanking our guest.